Grace distinguishes itself from other parts of the ways that we interact in that it is actually getting what you don't deserve. It is distinguished from mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. But grace goes beyond mercy and says, in fact, you will get what you don't deserve. There will be something given, something lavished on you. As I've worked for uh, and thought through this whole series and prepared for it, what I've realized is, is that the truth is in my own life, I slip into a worldview that's more karma-like than grace-like. I want to do some things this, with you this morning and kind of lay out for you what the, what the whole series will be like. It's a series I hope that it, the, the topic is so deep, so critical, so essential to how we live, how we see ourselves, that if you can't make every week, you've at least got to grab it on the internet and follow through each of the deals. Because what we're going to do is today we're going to talk about saved by grace, and just what it means to be given some things that you don't deserve, what Christ has accomplished for us. Next week, we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about burning through grace, which is a strange way of looking at what it means to be saved and how do you stay saved. And there's as much grace involved in our day-to-day -day life after we're saved as there is the day we come to Jesus. And then there, the week after that will be what we'll call grace-inspired change. Because there is an expectation, not that since everything's been given to you that you would just do what you want, but that there would be an expectation you would actually become a people of grace, a champion of this concept that saves us. Then we're gonna have some pictures of grace, take a look at different times in the scriptures where it's been kind of laid out with the first century church and how they wrestled with this concept juxtaposed uh, positioned against this Hebrew culture that was so law intensive. We'll have a guest speaker come who, will be a, who has been a champion of grace for um, a hero for all of my Christian life. Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata will be here as one of our pictures of grace. You will not want to miss that weekend. And it'll take us right up to Easter where we'll look at the grace around the cross and the grace around the resurrection. Today I want to jump into one of our, 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 actually our theme verse for the whole grace series and lay out for you how we're going to kind of take a look at today. It's pretty simple, just some things, just three phrases from a verse and what it might mean for you. But the depth of what God has for us, we're jumping into the deep end of the pool, folks, and there's a chance that some of us are going to get water in our nose. But it's worth, it's worth the coffin. It's worth the spitting because what God wants to show us about how he feels about us is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful grace extended. So let me pray for us. Pray for you and pray for me. And let's jump in together. God, this thought of grace is so wonderful, so magnificent, so great that Angels who are spending their entire existence in the glory of God long to peer into the way that you deal with mankind and see grace extended. It is a wonderful mercy, but it is beyond that. It is, it is a wonderful love extended, but it is beyond that. God, it is, it is something that 
we long to understand better. May you open our eyes and our minds and our hearts to know the depth and the breadth and the width and the height of your great love for us. God, would you empower our time together in such a way that the Holy Spirit will teach us just how much you have done for us in your love. And may grace become a theme that we not only count on, but that we extend to others. Use this time. Exalt the work of Christ. Enlarge your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you some questions, kind of some diagnostic questions, just to get us started, to see which worldview um, might be one that you kind of cling to more than you think. Here's some statements that might describe you. One, I have an overhanging sense of guilt and condemnation. I feel like I should do more, could do more, and yet never seem to do enough. I have a high level of anxiety and a low level of self-esteem. I fear that I may make wrong choices. If I make wrong choices, God will get angry with me. I'm never at peace for long. I'm always afraid of making mistakes. Is there any hint of anyone coming today, I hear this sometimes, that I had to come to church because I've got a big week coming and I didn't want, I wanted God to be for me. I've actually had someone hand me an envelope for an offering late in the, in the service saying, I didn't get this in, but I've got to get it in because I don't want anything bad to happen. I'm trying so hard to live the Christian life, but it doesn't seem to work and I'm so tired of trying. How about this one? I feel drawn to God, but I've been burned by religion in the past. I'm drawn to God, but I don't want to be one of those kind of people. I'm afraid of making mistakes and afraid that my mistakes have caused God to even give up on me. Sometimes I want to come home, but I'm not sure I'm still welcome. When I make a mistake, I fear that God is out to get me, so I work hard to appease God and overcome the mistake or the sin that I made. How about this statement? I really believe that what goes around comes around in almost every situation. Or this, do you sometimes feel that Christianity is not working for you and that your faith is letting you down? And is one of your favorite Bible verses, God helps those who helps themselves, which is not a Bible verse at all but often quoted as being one. If you find yourself saying yes to some of those statements, as I do, you would be in pretty common company. This, this is a, an amazing statistic for me, but a survey was done of U.S., United States Protestant people who claim to be Christians, people who identified themselves as Christians, that were Protestants in the United States, 19% said they believed that they are saved by grace, not works. Only 19%. Four out of five people in our country who identify themselves as Christian Protestants do not embrace grace as the means for salvation. And yet it is clear from the very first words of Christ throughout the New Testament that that is our source of salvation not only to be saved, but also for peace. We find ourselves falling into, actually, a system that we'll call karma in this series. Karma is defined like this. It's, it's, a, it's a, probably an oversimplification to be sure, but we'll use it in this way. It's an action seen as bringing upon oneself inevitable results, good or bad, either in this life or in a reincarnation. It is the idea that, and I think there's a definition up there for you, there's an, it's the idea that as things go, um, you get to keep trying. It's a cosmic principle according to each person rewarded or punished in one incarnation according to that person's deeds done in a previous incarnation. In other words, it's an idea of understanding that what you're going through right now, if it's really bad, you deserve it. You did something wrong either in this life or in a previous life. And so it, that karma, that sense of payback is following you. And so you've got to endure and work through this life 
so that hopefully you can get a little better karma next time around. Now, the, the other side of that is if your things are going really, really well, it's because you deserve it. You've been good before. So what happens in this kind of mindset is that it is a merciless um, situation and, and way of viewing your world. If I'm doing well, I would never share my wealth because I deserve all that I'm getting from previous karma. If you're doing poorly, I would never help you out because I don't want to mess with your bad karma. You're getting what you deserve and you need to endure it because if you endure it, maybe next time you'll do better. I just talked to a man last night. He said, I just came back from India and India is the living example of, of karma. That everything is, is done on base. I either deserve it or you deserve what you're getting. But the problem with that is, is the sad truth of that is, is that the United States looks more like that system than anything. We don't call it that. We may not embrace some of the terminology, but that worldview is seeped into a lot of stuff that we believe and a lot of things that we're going through. I remember reading this quote by C.S. Lewis. I'll share it with you. And I remember being identified in this, in this illustration, and I didn't like which person I was. He says this. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around, or fooling about with drink and sex and ambition, when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what it is meant by the offer of holiday by, a sea, by the sea. We are far too easily pleased. That there is this offer of grace. There is an invitation to come into a banquet setting. But we are pretty convinced because of our own our own lostness or our own struggles or our own insecurities that we'd be content just to sit by the curb in the mud and to make little mud pies and have our own little tea party when God has offered us infinitely more. The understanding of grace is not only central to our understanding of salvation, but it is central to the idea of living saved, of living out the life that God has called us to. Ephesians 2, if you brought a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to it or, or dial your phone up to it so that you can get there. Ephesians 2, verse 4 and, and, and following is going to be kind of the central theme for us. And I just want to kind of encourage you on the inside of your handout, there's some group questions. I hope that in your groups you're working your way through some of this. This is a topic as we work our way through it that will really demand more than our two hours together this morning. Nobody picked that up. Not really. We're not going to be together. <laughs> but just for our small time that we're going to, I'm going to jumpstart the discussion, but it's going to need to be something that hopefully you'll follow up on. Also, the digging deeper is centered around the Ephesians 2, 8 passage. And in case you've never even done that, allow that. You can click on our website, grab Digging Deeper, and use it to kind of shape some of the time that you have this week and delve into this depth of grace. Ephesians 2, let me read to you 4 through 9. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved. It's almost like he, he feels like he has to repeat it. You've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Grace is not only a good deal for us, it also brings great glory to God because no one deserves the grace extended. Now what I want to do is I want to talk to you about three phrases inside of this. For by grace, I want to talk to you about grace. I want to talk to you about saved, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about faith. Grace is a word that is used in the New Testament over 150 times. The particular structure in Ephesians 2 is kind of interesting in that it's a unique Greek structure, and this, don't worry about this, but it's a paraphrastic structure where they take 
two infinite verbs and put it with a perfect participle to say as much emphasis on it as they can. This is what Ephesians 2.8 actually says. Literally it says, by grace you have been saved in past time completely with the result that you are in a state of salvation presently which persists through present time and into eternity. That you exist, by by grace you have been saved, and and then that grace, that saved means you exist now, presently, in a perfect state of grace in the eyes of God, and it goes all the way back until since when you embraced grace, and it continues all the way forward for eternity. It was as if Paul said, let me grab every word I can use and jam it right in there so that you can understand the the depth of what it's saying. One particular guy says, the unending state of the believer in salvation could not have been put in stronger or clearer language. The finished result of the past act 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 of salvation are always present with the reader of the verse and promised to be for eternity. This word of grace is distinguished, I'd already said, by the fact that it's something, getting something that you don't deserve. By grace, by this gift, you are saved. And what does it mean to be saved? I want to introduce to you three terms. The, the series is actually on the front end, pretty doctrinally heavy. Because the proper thinking about what grace has accomplished for us will actually change the way we live and the way we, way we feel. We don't start with feelings. We start with thinking and work our way and trust that God will change our feelings. So I want to talk to you about three concepts. You get all of these concepts, but I want to hammer them uh, today a little bit in terms of what it means to be saved. The first word is Substitution. You understand this principle. It's so interesting to me that when I talk to people about substitution, that whenever it's in a church setting or what you would call a theological setting, they get all kind of googly-eyed. But every sporting event you watch, almost every single sporting event that you watch, if somebody gets hurt, they cart him off, and they bring somebody in with a different number to play as that person's substitute. He plays that position. He's in their stead. When I was in elementary school, I really only remember one teacher. My fifth grade teacher was Miss Baker. I think I had a crush on Miss Baker. I remember her, her as pretty. But it was an unusual year. I don't remember any other of my elementary school teachers um, from any of the other years. But I, this year, I remember not only Miss Baker, but Mrs. Struvy. Mrs. Struvy came into the class whenever Miss Baker was sick. She would come in, although she was not as pretty as Miss Baker, she would t- come in as our teacher and the substitute for her. We understand this concept. When we understand, when we apply that to Christ, what it simply means is that Christ's death, the central concept of Christ's death, is that it was done on our behalf. 1 Peter 3.18 kind of makes this really clear. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. It's this understanding that he has, he has done something on our behalf. Your sin will be paid for by one person or another. The offer is, is that Christ has paid for it. Or you can. But someone will. Sin has to be dealt with. God doesn't deal on a curve. He can't just turn a blind eye and work things out kind of in the end. It's the understanding that God allowed Christ to step in on our behalf. The second word is reconciliation. Reconciliation is also a term that we're very familiar with in our culture. Whenever there's a a problem between two people. If you've got two friends that are at each other's throats about something, there's an enmity, a strife between them. You try to deal with that strife and bring those people together to kind of reconcile them toward one another. The work of Christ has reconciled us to God. This comes out in in several different ways, but 2 Corinthians 5 shows it maybe the most clear. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a brand new creation. 
The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. It's this idea that that there was a problem between us and God. And Christ, as our substitute, has stepped in and paid for that problem and then has made a way for us to be reconciled to God. That we could be seen right. We could see, be seen righteous because of the wonderful work of what Christ has done for us. So it's substitution and, recon- and reconciliation. And then finally, there's the word redemption which is probably the most, more general of the three and the more uh, far-reaching. And we understand this concept of redemption. Redemption is, is taught with three different words in the New Testament. Let me give you the different ways that they're used. The first one is to buy something by purchasing it with a price. We already know that Christ, as our substitute, has paid the penalty for sin. It's the idea of buying us. The second word is the buying out of someplace. That you actually, you take something and buy it out of something and make it your own. Most of the times the illustration in the, in the New Testament when they, this word is used is that as you are bought out of slavery to sin and brought into the family of God. And then the third word is this idea of being bought and released to be free. And the full concept of redemption is, is that a price was paid for our behalf, buying us out of the slavery to sin, by grace, through faith, and setting us free to be God's children. No longer slaves to a law of rules or expectations or some making up for the mistakes that we have made in the past. You begin to see the depth of what it means to be by grace saved. But that's not enough. There's a free offer. There's a free um, extension by God to you. But it has to be personally appropriated by faith. That's our third term, by faith. Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is the assurance of things not seen. That at some point in time, I recognize that I'm a sinner I have done things wrong in my past and that Christ has paid the penalty for that sin as my substitute, reconciling me to God and making a relationship with God possible. And by grace, it is offered to me. But I still have to take a step of faith and say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I See, faith doesn't necessarily make all of those doubts go away. In fact, doubt is the bedfellow of faith. It doesn't make all my life work out. It makes it that if I just come to faith, I'll be healthy, wealthy, wise, thin, beautiful. That's just bull that they do on TV to try to get your money. But what it does is it avails you, it appropriates to you the offer of Christ. By faith I receive, I recognize my need, I embrace the reality of what you have done, and by faith I step into this relationship saying, I, want, I don't get it all, but what I do understand I embrace, I, I receive. By faith I appropriate that. When we do our baptisms here, we say, Have you, do you believe that Christ came, died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead? And do you, have you placed your faith in that work on the cross for payment for your sins? Do you believe that reconciliation has made, been made possible? Do you believe that substitution for you has been done? And are you embracing that, stepping into faith as the payment for your sins? Now, what, why, why do this? Why go through the problem? Why not just God work out a system where he could say, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep a tally on everybody's good works and their bad works, and at the end of the day, I'm just gonna tally them up, a little tick for good, good work there, tick, tick, tick. Oh, bad day over here, tick, 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 tick. And at the end of the day, if you got enough ticks on the good side, and not very many on the bad side, you're in. Why not just do that? 
Why not just be that way? Well, because to get to God, righteousness is required. To see this illustration, I need some help. I need, um, I need somebody to give me a hand with this illustration. I won't embarrass you or ask you to talk, but I need somebody. Would you come up? Would she come up? Okay, she will. Okay. <laughs> come on up. Come right over here. Okay, I want you to hold this and stand right there. Okay, don't move. Got it? Okay. In 1991, at the World Championships of the Track and Field, America had its two finest long jumpers in the same event. One of them is very famous. His name is Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis and the other man, I'll tell you him in a minute, um, were doing a jump off. And to um, imagine if I were to say to you, you have to jump like Carl. Now, on that day in 1991, these two jumpers both jumped farther than anyone has ever jumped or since. It's been over 20 years and no one has gotten close to what these two guys jumped in this one event. To give you an idea, got it? To give you an idea of how far Carl jumped. That'd be a pretty good jump. Because that's not it. Yeah. That'd be world class. But that's not it. You got to jump to here. Now I know somebody in here thinks they can do it. <laughs> but the reality is, let me just help you out. Doesn't matter how hard you train. Doesn't matter how hard you try. Nobody in this room, unless they cheat, can jump this far. Let's just set it down right there so people can remember it. Can you set it down right there? Okay, you're done. Thank you. It seems unbelievable that a man could fly through the air that far without a trampoline or something. To reach to God on your own merit is a thousand times more difficult than jumping as far as Carl Lewis. Here's what's crazy. Carl Lewis jumped that far and the very next jumper's name was Mike Powell. And he jumped an inch and three quarters farther and set a world record that's never been touched. Unless it's been in wind dated or in high altitude said, and it's never been, no matter has been close legally. To say to you're gonna to get to God is, is a hundred times harder, a thousand times harder than saying jump like Carl. And God understood and knew, and knew that you could not work your way there. That a, an idea of working your way to God is like the lie of the um, concentration camp, Auschwitz. You know, it had, a, on its, it had a sign welcoming people as they came in to that concentration camp. And I don't speak German, so I'm gonna try here. It's, the sign said, Arbeit macht frei, which means work will set you free. God understood you could work your fingers to the bone. And you're never jumping like Carl. You're never achieving the holiness of God. You'll never be perfect, ever. And God so desired a free, loving relationship with you that he jumped on your behalf. 
and bore the sin as our substitute at Calvary, reconciling us to a holy God by buying us out of slavery. God in his mercy not only did this for us, but he made salvation quite easy to comprehend. It's as easy as A, B, C. A stands for admit. Admit that you are a sinner. Admit that you don't reach the standards of God. Admit that you can't jump like Carl. In all of my dealings, in all of my talkings with people, in my whole life, I've only met one person who didn't admit that they had made a mistake and had sinned. Only one. And that person was being indicted at the time. <laughs> so it was kind of weird. But most of us, most of us in this room would readily admit that we don't even keep our own standards. We believe that the, you know, your own standards might be as simple as we think you ought to treat people with respect, but sometimes you're disrespectful. You think you, that people ought to tell the truth, but sometimes you lie. You think that slow drivers ought to get out of the left lane, but sometimes you ride over there in the left lane and forget about it. We don't even keep our own standard, and God is saying my standards are even more difficult to keep. Admit. Confession is simply agreeing with God about what you did that he already saw. Agreeing with God, not making excuses, not justifying what you've done, but just agreeing with God with what you've done that he's already seen. B stands for believe. By faith, Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, bore the pain, the shame, the guilt of your sin and mine at Calvary and rose from the dead, defeating death and offering us new life on the third day. To admit that you've done things wrong, that you could never jump, and to believe that Jesus jumped for you. And then C is to simply call on God. To call on God for salvation. It says this in Romans chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confessed and are saved. Is there more to it? There's more to the depth of God, absolutely. Does your life just automatically turn around as soon as you do that? Not usually, although sometimes something dramatic might happen. But God has made the, the way to him so easy so that a child can understand it. And even us that are a little more sophisticated in our deception can get to it. Admit Believe, call on God. If you're here today and you've never publicly done that, you've never come to the point where you've made a decision and you've let somebody know of that salvation, I would plead with you, stop trying to jump. You will not Make it. Come to Christ today. His grace is extended to you. He is crazy, crazy about you. He is not waiting on you to get your life together so you can come to him because he knows and understands you'll never get your life together. He is in the business. He specializes in helping screwed up, insecure people in fact, we gather as screwed up, insecure people listening to a screwed up, insecure person talk. <laughs> and God specializes in drawing those people to himself. Admit your sin. Believe in Christ. Call on him today.
We're going to sing a couple of songs that sing about the truth of grace and how he is mighty to save and to break through the, the, the barriers that we have. And, and, and that grace is enough for us. And while we're doing that, I'm going to stand. I'll be right over here in this area right here. If you would like to come down and just let somebody know, just come and let me know that you would, would like to embrace the ABC road to Christ. You would like to, for the first time or just for the first time publicly, to let somebody know. You don't have to come to me. If you came with somebody, you can let them know. We had people come to Christ last night. I am certain God is wooing some of you now, and you're thinking, oh, no, I hate this. I don't want to go up and see the bald guy. I hate this stuff. <laughs> then just tell somebody that you came with, or take your card and mark it and say, I, have, I came to Christ today. Let someone know. Now, for those of us in the room that have already become Christians, we spend a whole lot of time, even though we, re we recognize that Jesus jumped for us, we still come over here, and we just go, ah! <laughs> and we spend the rest of our life thinking we still got to jump. But yeah, we were saved by the jump, but we still got to jump it. And that's next week. Because <laughs> we're burning through grace as believers just as much as those of us who, when we came to Christ, and the wonderful thing is, is that the supply of grace extended to us is limitless, just as God's love is for us. Let me pray for us. Lord, as we sit here and just listen to this, the words of your great love for us and the free gift that was offered to us. We acknowledge that the gift was free, but it wasn't cheap. Such love for us is too wonderful. Such, such grace extended is too deep for us to comprehend. And there are some who you have orchestrated time and events and moods and, and everything right now so that they could hear again, or maybe for the first time, your great love for them. And they are strangely drawn to you. May they understand that that, that strange feeling is the Spirit of God impressing upon their souls how much you love and care for them. And God, may they call out to you and be saved. And then, Father, there are a boatload of us in the room who desperately cling to grace for our salvation, but slide into a mindset of works believing that works will set us free, when in reality it's only the gate to some kind of a concentration camp of our own shame and guilt. Forgive us, God, for jumping again when Christ has already paid the price fully. I pray you create in us a deeper understanding of grace, a deeper appreciation of what it's done for us, a deeper love for you because of it, and a grace-filled approach to our life as we interact with your world. May we embrace and know that Christ is enough, that you are mighty to save and break through all of our sin. And that grace is enough. It is enough for us. We thank you for that and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.